Hey, we're back with another edition of Austin Fit Talks. Very excited about our guest today, Todd Withorn, a health and wellness speaker, also author of Fit Happens. Todd, I'm excited to talk to you because we've had some fitness coaches on in various sports the last couple of weeks, and then we've also had some dietitians and some experts in different types of diets that can make you healthier. I feel like you kind of blend both of those worlds to some extent. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think so, Ricky. Thank, uh, first of all, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I'm a health and wellness guy. My background's in kinesiology and exercise physiology. Uh, I went to UCLA, I grew up in California. I was born in Texas, but I grew up in California. And I've always been, you know, pretty focused on, on you know, personally health and wellness. Uh, I was really fortunate back in 1999 to go to work with Dr. Ken Cooper uh, here in Dallas at the Cooper Aerobics Center. Uh, some of the, the viewers may know that, you know, Dr. Cooper, I, I look at Dr. Cooper as Yoda. He's the guy that <laughs> the word aerobics. Uh, back in 1968, he's written like 19 books. So I worked there for 14 years with a lot of really, really smart folks. And what some people don't know about the, the aerobic center, it houses the largest database, objective database on fitness in the world. And they've published over 600 scientific papers in the past 20 or 25 years. So it was a great, great place to work with some really crazy smart people and I'm all about data. You know, what, you know, one of my favorite quotes, a guy named David Hume a couple hundred years ago used to say that a wise man proportions his belief to the evidence. And so evidence is, is important for me. And to your point, you know, there's a lot of theories, there's a lot of opinions, uh, and I get it. I listen to them all, you know, around, <laughs> around food in particular. Uh, I always like to say that you know, if you're at a party and, you know, some sort of gathering, a social gathering, which we used to have back in the old days. Don't um, remember those. Yeah, but <laughs> some people might. You don't want to talk politics. You don't want to talk religion. And you don't want to talk nutrition because there's always going to be a couple people in there that are thoroughly convinced that the way they eat should be the way you're eating. And again, the evidence doesn't support that. There's a lot of ways that we can eat and still be healthy. Um, but I find generally when people want to talk about food is that they're generally, or, you know, they, they say, Hey, can we talk about nutrition? When I drill down a little bit, what they usually want to talk about is weight, not necessarily health. Now I put those in distinct buckets, by the way, there, there's overlap, no, no question, but there are ways that you can eat to maintain a healthy weight that don't involve kale and quinoa mm -hmm. or, you know, everybody kind of has these, these real, not everybody. Many people have these steadfast opinions about nutrition uh, that is not necessarily supported by the science. So I'm always, I, you know, in general, I'm a rather skeptical guy. I always like to try to figure out who I'm listening to, what, what is their intention, why do they want me to think like they think. You know, I ask, are, are they elected? Are they appointed? Are they educated? Those are, those are all filters that I like to, to put things through. So in general, what I, the way I think about it uh, in terms of communicating health and wellness, nutrition, exercise, all of those things, what's the science show? Um, what are the therapeutic windows, so to speak? How much is enough? How much is too much? Uh, what does the, the data really show? And then what is reasonable that will fit within your life? Because it's all about ultimately health, I think, boils down to just one word, and that is habit. What can you do that's habitual? A habit is something you do without thinking about it. And the more we think about something, the less likely it's probably going to happen. So can you figure out a way to strategically build healthy habits that you can do without thinking about it that will allow you to live a long and healthy life? And, and I firmly believe the answer to that is yes. I think that's really interesting because, you know, not that I've got all the answers by any means, but I'm a runner. I like to run every morning and that's part of my day. And people say to me, Oh, I hate running or I can't make the time for that. And I say to them, you know, it, it's just part of my routine. It's just, you know, I get up in the morning, I go for a run. But, but to your point, yeah. I think the key that I tell people is it's got to be repeatable. It can't be something like you can't be joining some absurdly expensive gym where you're driving for 30 minutes to go work out in the morning. Yeah. And yeah. it's got to be something that you can do every day. How, how do you guide people to make it something that is, to your point, that can become a habit? So let me ask you a question. Are you a pretty good runner? I mean, I'm decent for my age. Yeah. All right. And you like it, don't you? I do. I love it. We generally do what we're good at and we like what we're good at. And so runners are usually pretty good runners. You know, I know you and I both uh, know Paul Carosa, 
Paul's a pretty good runner. You know, pretty good. Yes. He's a freak, actually, and, and <laughs> blessed to be a good runner. You're not going to see Paul spending hours and hours in the weight room. But mm-hmm. if you were a really good weightlifter, if you were, you know, naturally strong and, and powerful, you'd probably like lifting weights. And so that's, that's one of the things that I would recommend to folks is find something you enjoy. Uh, because we can all do anything for a short period of time. You know, diets would be a good example of that. Everybody's, you know, yeah, you can, you can eat X for a week or two weeks or a month, but after a while, if you don't like it, it's, you're probably not going to stick with it. And so, same thing with physical activity. Find something you like. Um, and, and there are, there's certainly, this, the evidence supports this. There are a lot of people that, that truly get, get a jolt, you know, the endorphin effect of, of physical activity and you feel great. I would put myself in that category, but I know not everybody does it. And that exercise to some people is a four letter word, but we, you know, we know the, the amazing benefit to physical activity. And so, you know, one of my mottos is walk the dog, even if you don't have one, you don't have to be a runner. You don't have to be a triathlete. You don't have to climb a mountain. You don't have to join a gym, but if you want to thrive as a human being, you have to figure out a way to move on a regular basis because we were born and designed beautifully to move. Uh, that's just the way it is. Our world doesn't necessarily promote it because you know most of us are thought workers and we sit for a living and stare at a screen, but that's not the way we were designed. We were designed to run and jump and fall and dance and play and do all those things that we did when we were kids, you know, when we were free range kids. But to your point, you socialize running. You get up in the morning. That's what I do. It's like brushing your teeth or putting on your seatbelt or, you know, uh, your shoes. You don't think about it. You just do it. And the research shows that about 40 to 50 percent of our daily activity is habitual. Um, we just do that. So that's really the key, I believe, is if you want to live a long and healthy life. And, and those two things are important to me is that I don't want to just live long. I want to live well. I want to really, really be able to embrace life and have options for as long as possible. The key to that is being intentional around your habits. And and if you can embrace healthy habits, much like you've done, that's the key. And and the payoff is not what you do once or twice. The payoff is what you do over the course of time. And you're then able to, you know, the way you would define it kind of medically or scientifically, is push back the onset of disability. That's what I think we all need to be thinking about is that, you know, we don't know how long we're going to live, but one thing that we can really control is how well we live. And, you know, I'm 63 and I have a new addiction. I'll be very honest with right out front. I'm going to tell you, I am now addicted to wake surfing. (laughs) It is the greatest. Wow. Yeah. And it's on the cover of the new Austin Fit magazine. I know the young lady I saw, I just saw the picture today, as a matter of fact, but how awesome. I mean, it is, it's, Fantastic. It's as fun, if not more enjoyable for me than water skiing. And when you fall, it's not like you're in a car wreck, you know? <laughs> and so yeah. it's, and, and, you know, it, it pushes you and it's, you know, it's just a, so to me, that wouldn't, I wouldn't put that in the exercise category. I'd put that in the, you know, kind of the mental health category for me is that when I can start my day by going wake surfing on Lake Grapevine here in North Texas, where I live, the rest of my day is awesome. It doesn't matter what happens after that. And so that, you know, kind of to your point is find something you enjoy or find, you know, experiment and find what you enjoy and people that you like doing it with. So, you know, assuming it's going to be, you know, safe and socially distance appropriate. Um, but the one thing we know, especially during this whole COVID thing, is that physical activity is, is so, so critical, not just to our physical health, but also our emotional health. And getting outside and breathing fresh air and getting a little vitamin D, it just changes your brain in a very positive way. I, I, that, you led me perfectly to what I wanted to ask you, but one of the things we were talking about before we started this is how this is a critical time to be yeah. healthy in all aspects of life. Why, yeah. why do you think that is? I mean, aside from the obvious benefit that we want to be healthy to potentially fight off the virus, but it, just in general, why do you think this is such an important time? I, well, from my perspective, and obviously I, I have, you know, a focus group of one from a historical perspective, but I've, I've never seen anything like this at all. Um, I look at the, the, the new world, or someone yesterday I heard refer to it as the, this new abnormal. Um, I look at it as starting on March the 11th. That's the cut point for me, um, because that's the day that the, um, that the 
Adam Silver, the commissioner of the NBA, shut down the league, and I have a basketball addiction, uh, besides my wake surfing addiction. Uh, it was the day that uh, Tom Hanks and his wife announced they had the virus, and it was the day that the government shut down international travel. At that point, I'd been hearing a little bit about it back here, and then suddenly, boom, oh, this is real. And, and so from that point on, the elephant in the room for almost 8 billion people on the planet has been the exact same thing. We have an invisible enemy that is impacting each and every one of us to a varying degree. That's what's interesting is that some people from this has, have been mildly inconvenienced, other people have been devastated. And, and from my perspective, this, the virus, by the way, has, is apolitical. It doesn't know or care how you vote. So this is not a political topic. This is, from my standpoint, a health topic. And this virus is not as smart as we are, but it's extremely patient. And we can't ignore what's happening. And so when you think about where we are now, we started with the virus in March, but then we've obviously added to it the economy, which is also a very much of a lead story. Then we, in, in back in... Uh, in uh, just a couple months ago is, was when we had the, the incident, obviously that a tragedy that took place in Minneapolis. So now we have a, a social unrest that's, that's dominating a lot of our news as it should. And then we put on top of that a presidential election. So if people don't acknowledge that they're stressed or that they're anxious or that they're scared or worried, uh, these, are, these are real things. We can't, we can't pretend, especially as guys, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fine, everything's good. It's not good. We got a lot of stuff happening. And regardless of what you may think, every single person is impacted in some way. And, and they're worried and concerned about either themselves or someone else. And so I think right now, uh, more than ever in my life, it makes sense to, to try to control the things that you can control. And I put them in two buckets. Number one is, how do you reduce your risk of catching the virus? And we don't need to talk about that. Everybody knows what that looks like. Um, by the way, wearing a mask makes sense. Okay, the science makes sense. I, I don't, again, it's not a political statement. I'm just saying it makes sense. And it makes sense for other people, not just yourself, but primarily for other people. So let's not get wrapped around the axle on that politically. It's just a fact. The virus is impacted by masks. So pay attention to that. But the other category, the other bucket that I think is important is what can you do if you get punched? Um, you may remember Mike Tyson used to say that everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Yeah. And we get punched in the mouth and we're getting punched on a regular basis. So what can you do to keep from buckling, to increase your resilience and your ability to fight back, improve your immunity? And again, none of that is, is new, Ricky. You know that. I mean, we, we know what works. Health is not a mystery. Health is a puzzle. We have the puzzle pieces in front of us. We just have to figure out a way to put them together. Um, we, we shouldn't be waiting for the, you know, the vaccine that's going to cure everything or the magic bullet that will cure obesity or diabetes. We know what works. We absolutely, we know. It's not even a guess. We know the, the things that we can double down on right now that will improve our physical and emotional health. Physical activity, sleep, proper nutrition, uh, all of these things, and there's, the list goes is you know much longer than that, obviously, but those are the big three. Um, and if right now we can be prioritizing those, it's going to help us manage getting through day to day. And rather than trying to boil the ocean and worry about all these big you know goals and strategies and everything, just try to win the day. You know that's the, that's the most important thing. You know I wrote an article for the the last issue of of Austin Fit. And it was, that was the name of the title, win the day. In fact, win the half day. Just try to, you know, get through. Don't try to, um, you know, put too much pressure on yourself. Give yourself some grace and practice some gratitude. I mean, I think, and, and again, almost from a selfish standpoint, being grateful is really important right now because we can, we can focus a lot on what we don't have. We can focus a lot on the challenges and problems that are in front of us. And I'm not, I'm not at all trying to minimize that. But if we try to focus on the things that we can be grateful for, uh, it's gonna change our outlook, it's gonna change us the way we feel, and it's gonna change our ability to have a positive impact on other people. And that's why I think we're on this earth. And so we do have to fight through this together. Uh, and we've gotta recognize that everybody's dealing with something right now. And, and if we can help them along the way, everybody wins. I think the win the day is so smart because 
some of these days feel like marathons right now. You know, I mean, it just, yeah. it, it's Groundhog's Day and the days feel so long. And um, one of the things you mentioned in that article, though, is, is, is this guy, the phone, and, and how you've yeah. made a, a point to detach mm-hmm. for a little bit in the morning. I know that's something I struggle with. I know that one of the first things I do as soon as I get up is lift that phone off the nightstand and my head's buried in it for, you know, yeah. 15 or 30 minutes. What, what change have you seen from doing that? And how difficult is oh. that to try to unplug? It's not as hard as you may think. Um, Interesting. I, I've been blessed the past two years. Uh, my son and I, my son lives in Los Angeles and he's grown now, but um, the past two years we've gone to Patagonia in uh, mm-hmm. late January, early February, gone hiking. Very, very Southern Chile. And it is so awesome. And I hope I get to go back someday. But as part of that, we unplugged for like four days at a time. It wasn't even an option. And it is, I, I got exposed to how, how freeing it is. And so coming back home um, and then coming basically right into this pandemic thing, I started recognizing all of the noise that's out there, right? And, and technology, I'm not a, by the way, I'm not a dinosaur. I, I, I <laughs> put the genie back in the bottle. I'm not, a, I'm not recommending that you, you know, completely detach, but here's what I'm recommending. And it's easier than, than you might think. Try tomorrow morning getting up. Now, again, depending on what your schedule is, but try for just five minutes to not look at your phone, not turn on the TV, not turn on the radio, not pick up the newspaper, which for some of you, that, that's an old, old thing. It's a piece of paper that is delivered. <laughs> it's pretty crazy. But just try to start your day intentionally thinking about what you want to think about. Now, you may not have anything that immediately surfaces to the top, but, but give, it a, give it a chance. I think what you'll see is pretty amazing. So I get up in the morning, go to the bathroom, feed the dog, get a cup of coffee or tea, and then I sit down, and I am very, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty aggressive with it. I am not going to look at my phone for a minimum of five minutes. Now, sometimes it becomes 25 minutes or even more, and I start thinking about stuff, and I start kind of planning my day or thinking about someone that, you know, that I may need to reach out to and ask them how they're doing or offer them a pat on the back, at least, you know, through electrons. Um, and then you start, you know, start thinking about what you're grateful for. Just think about one thing. And rather than one thing, think about one person. Um, it changes your mindset. And again, five minutes is all I'm asking. Just try it. And it's pretty amazing because if you think about Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, email, Snapchat, whatever, all of those things, added to your news feed, added to all of the different elements, there's somebody out there or something out there, some you know bot that is trying to get you to think a certain way for their advantage. And I think that I owe it to myself to kind of, kind of own what I think about at least initially in the, in the beginning of the day. And I, I really focus on being grateful if I go out to get the newspaper and it's not raining, I look around, I take some, you know, big deep breath and I think to myself, wow, this is awesome. I've been an unbelievable day. Great opportunity. I'm alive. I, I have a wonderful family. I've got friends. I'm employed. Uh, even if, you know, we have, and we all have things that are, we could focus on the negative, but just try focusing on the positive and not letting someone else influence what you think about. After that five minutes is up, then then jump in, but see, just give it a shot. And I think you'll find that it can be pretty freeing. I think it's so smart too, because I know at least for me personally, it just snowballs, you know, once you get in there and you see one thing and then you click on that link and then you click on that link and yeah. then it's, and then it's all over to your point, your, your mind's going a hundred different ways and, yeah. and people are controlling what you're thinking about. You know, uh, one of my favorite quotes is from Reed Hastings, CEO of Netflix. And he says his three biggest competitors are Facebook, YouTube, and sleep. And that's mm-hmm. it. You think about all of the individuals, all of the businesses, their job is to get your attention and to influence the way you think. And, you know, a perfect example, you know, you and I both, you know, spent quite a bit of time working in media. And you know that, the, you know, when bad weather is coming, when there's really, yep. Um, dangerous weather, those weather guys, first of all, would always take the time from the sports guys. Hey, it's <laughs> always, <laughs> but man, they, they knew the stations knew that bad weather was great for viewership. 
And, and so it's the same thing right now with all these news feeds. They know that fear will grip you. And, and I, I don't like being yelled at. So if you, you know, depending on your cable channel of choice, I'm, I'm always amazed that you, you flip on and someone's yelling. You know, just give me some information that I can use in a positive way, get what I need to get, and then move on. Um, so it's, uh, it's an interesting world, kind of long, long discussion around your point, but we've got to really focus on taking care of ourselves before we can have any influence on, on anybody else. Um, you know, John Wooden, one of my heroes, the former basketball coach, late great coach Wooden at UCLA, used to say, you can't live a perfect day without doing something for someone who will never be able to repay you. And I think it's a pretty good mantra for life. And so if we can stop focusing on the me and kind of focus on the we and how we can have a positive influence on, on our world, on our day, on our whatever our footprint happens to be, um, I think it will help. And also understanding that sleep, good nutrition, and physical activity is going to help your Bugatti run very efficiently. And that's kind of the way I look at the, you know, the human, you know, if we were a car, what kind of car would you want to be? You don't want to be a clunker, right? You don't want to be just <laughs> something that's struggling to get down the road. You want to be a Bugatti, the most expensive production car in the world. And if we think of ourselves as the only mechanic that can work on our Bugatti, then that's easy. And, and to your point, getting up in the morning and starting your day with a run, you know, is probably the same way that I like to start my day, you know, by going wake surfing. You know, I'm a cyclist, so I like the same thing. I hop on a bike, and I, I feel different when I'm done. I'm usually a lot, you know, sweatier than when I start. <laughs> Especially but, this time of year. Exactly. I rode last night, which was not super smart. But mm. you come back, you feel different. And so we're sometimes preaching to the choir. You know, I get it. People that read Austin Fit, you know, we're, we're probably we're, we're, the, we're in the choir. We're the converted. But I, I think it is important to recognize the incredible thousands of benefits that come from physical activity and from taking care of yourself. And one of the most important things is pushing back disability. It's going to allow you to do the things that you love for a longer period of time. And the data on that is overwhelmingly positive, um, that we can control our quality of life for a long period of time. Something you mentioned a minute ago I wanted to touch on a little bit is, is the nutrition piece of it. And, and something you said I think is really interesting is it doesn't have to be kale and, and greens all the time to be healthy because i think that's what a lot of people push back on when they think about changing their diet is oh my gosh it's going to be so expensive it's yep. going to be so much effort to you know get all these vegetables yep. and make foods maybe i don't like that much or yep. what, what's your you know your advice to people when they're starting to think about changing their diet but they don't want to make this you know extreme change if you will so um that's a that's a good question i i i like to think that there's a difference between what i think and what i know <laughs> for um, 14 years, I worked at the Cooper Aerobics Center, learned a lot from a lot of really smart people. And then in 2013, I left, I joined a Dallas-based company, it's called Naturally Slim. Um, most people have probably never heard of it, but it's a, it's a corporate program that we deliver through employers um, to help people improve their health. Uh, on the surface, it's promoted as a weight loss program because 71 plus percent of Americans are either overweight or obese. And we know that's a big intrinsic motivator for a lot of people. Mm. So when we talk about nutrition, I always, as I mentioned earlier, I, you know, I push back, are we talking about weight? Or are we talking about health? Those are two separate distinct conversations. Um, and sometimes it's hard for people to recognize that you can, you can improve your health by continuing to eat pizza or Mexican food or barbecue. Um, it's not what you eat. It's when and how you eat that will help you lose weight and keep that weight off. And I, I say that, I slow down and kind of say that because a lot of people right now are thinking that's, that's absolutely wrong. Well, I will tell you that we've got almost a thousand different corporations and, and organizations in this country that have gone through our program. And the data is overwhelming. We have peer reviewed published studies looking at things like metabolic syndrome and blood pressure and uh, not just weight. Uh, and we have clients like the University of Texas system, uh, like the state of Texas, um, the, the Texas Municipal League, the Texas Association of Counties, uh, Google, uh, American Airlines, on and on and on. So we have big populations that we can look at that data. And what's fascinating is that if you can help people lose as little as 3% of their body weight, 
then the, the measurable reduction of risk around conditions such as diabetes goes down appreciably. Now, some people need or, or ought to, from a, from a health standpoint, they probably could benefit from more than just a 3% weight loss. Um, in science, we study percentages as opposed to pounds. But when you, you think about it, um, what is it that we're interested in? We want to look and feel better. And so when people want to talk about kale and quinoa, I'm not arguing with that. That's, that's great. And, and the quality of the fuel that you put in your Bugatti makes a big difference. Hmm. But you've got to help people learn the skills to manage the environment in which we live. And we live in an obesogenic environment. The reason that we have 42% of Americans that are, that are overweight or, or, excuse me, that are obese right now, um, meaning their BMI is greater than 30, uh, that number is going up. And since COVID, it's going up even faster than before. So it is not bad design, and it's not just that people aren't necessarily always eating, hanging out at, at Central Market or Whole Foods. It, it, it's really that the environment in total is contributing to obesity and everything that goes along with that. And when I say obesity, I also usually add in that category physical inactivity, because those are the two big, the two big stakes. And so it really is, can you help people figure out what works for them, not necessarily radically changing their behavior around food because people like certain things. And if you take it away, they can do it for a short time, but it's not gonna last for long and that's why diets don't work. But if you can help people learn to eat differently, uh, to slow down, to be mindful of their hunger levels, uh, to eat when they're hungry, not when they're not, and then to help people really recognize what we call your vital needs, what's going on in your life that may be influencing your behavior around food. Uh, is it boredom? Is it stress? Uh, is it a saboteur that maybe you work with or live with that is maybe even inadvertently derailing your effort to be healthy? So it's really a very, very complex topic of all of these things that overlap. But when it comes to eating, it's pretty simple to me. Um, it boils down to three simple words. When people say nutrition so complicated and I say, no, it's really not. The first thing that we need to do, and pardon my French, is cut the crap. Mm -hmm. It's the best place, I think, to start. Now, you can get around all these other, you know, intermittent fasting or keto or paleo or you pick it. I mean, we can talk all about that stuff. But the, the goal here is to help people feel better feel better physically and mentally, and how can you help them do that? And there's a lot of ways to get that done. The primary thing that you can do, I believe, to radically improve your health is to simply cut the crap. And, and that's not hard. We know what's right from wrong. Um, food's not, you know, nutrition's not complicated. We need six things, protein, carbohydrate, and fat, healthy levels of all of those. Then we need vitamins and minerals and water in appropriate combinations. Um, and we can get there a lot of different ways. The data is clear. The two diets that really, really, that stand the test of time, the Mediterranean diet, which is not really a diet, or the DASH diet, which is the dietary approaches to stopping hypertension. If those two diets were to get together and have a baby, that would be the <laughs> diet. And that's, that's really, I think, a good place to start if you're being reasonable and objective. Uh, eliminate processed foods as much as possible. Sugar is everywhere, and especially if you're carbohydrate sensitive, it can be a problem, and it lives in not just the sugar bowl and not just in the ice cream container. It, it lives mm -hmm. in a lot of places. Um, and if you can reduce your sugar intake, but continue to eat the things that you love, eat it differently, be mindful of your behavior around it, lose a little bit of weight, improve your physical activity a little bit, then the numbers all go in the, in the right direction. It's, it's stunning when you look at it as it from an individual standpoint, but it's really exciting when you look at it from a population standpoint. We can absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt, measurably improve the direction of the health of large populations. And it's one of the coolest things I've ever been a part of. I think that's so smart because it really kind of ties back to what we were saying about exercise, about it being something that you like and you can repeat. And to your point of what you're saying here is you don't necessarily have to eliminate all those things you like, just be cognizant of how you approach it and be smart about it. Exactly right. It's exactly right. And, and, and I think be open-minded, you know, and, and experiment, try different things and see what works. But, you know, for a lot of people, um, you know, they didn't, 
and again, it's all about the evidence. We talked about that earlier. Three to 5% weight loss is gonna make you appreciably healthier. Um, now, again, depending on, no, not one person watching this right now is average. Just keep that in mind. Uh, data is usually, you know, re evidence research is usually about the averages, but none of us are average. So every, we're all different. And we, we, certain things are gonna work for us. We have to experiment, but it is, it's very gratifying especially, and again, it's probably not the people that are watching us, but there's a lot of people in our world that have truly given up. And if when you talk to them and you get them in a comfortable situation and you develop some trust, they'll share with you, I, it's too late. I've tried everything. I, it, it's not going to work. And, and that's not true. Um, people need hope. And, and I'm telling you, regardless of wherever you've been, whatever you've been through, whatever you're struggling with or whatever you think, it is absolutely possible for you to move in a healthy direction. It is absolutely possible, if your scoreboard is the scale, to lose weight and keep it off without feeling as if you're deprived or insane. Um, we, we are beautifully designed, and the Bugatti will respond to the way you treat it, the way you take care of it, and what you ask it to do. Um, and again, Ricky, you and I are just getting to know one another. I have a feeling we're gonna be friends for a while because uh, we have a lot of commonalities, but it really, is just helping people, meet them, meeting them where they are, giving them a little bit of hope, uh, giving them some direction and some guidelines and allow them to kind of head, head in, a, in a positive direction. But it's, it's ultimately, that's the biggest key, I think, is that in our world, we outsource a lot of things. You know, we get people to mow our lawn or pay our taxes or, you know, we used to have people cook our food, but that's, that's getting harder and harder these days. But you can't outsource your health. You just can't do it. Um, there's almost 8 billion people in the world and no one has more impact than we do. So doing a habit inventory, I think is a pretty, pretty important thing. And if you can figure out, um, you know, how to build healthy habits, by the way, I, you know, I have no tie in or I've not even met James clear, but one of the best books I could ever recommend is called atomic habits. It came out in 2018 and uh, it's an, it's an awesome resource. He's got a, he's got a webpage and a free newsletter that comes out once a week. So if you want to figure out a way to change your habits, it's a, that's a very good place to start. I talk about it a little bit in my book. We certainly utilize it in our naturally slim program, but, but really that's that at the end of the day, it's all about habits. So I would highly encourage you to continue to do what you're doing with that morning run, because that helps you set the stage for the entire day. And over the course of the next many, many years of your life, it's going to pay huge dividends. I agree. Todd, so much great information here. We really appreciate you making time for us. Awesome. Ricky, uh, I appreciate the invitation and uh, really a pleasure being with you today. What's the best way for people to find you if they want to learn more? Because I know you've got a lot to offer. Uh, well, um, you can go to, you know, I have a website, toddwhitthorn.com, which I know Whitthorn is kind of complicated. Uh, I have, I actually, something I started about three months ago is a uh, twice a week, I do a, a short little podcast. The name will tell you all you need to know. It's called In Less Than a Minute. Um, and my job and my goal is in, in 60 seconds or less to give people a little nugget of either information or inspiration that will have a positive impact on their life. So that's on, that's on Facebook, it's on YouTube, it's on my website. Um, but uh, that would be kind of a, probably a good place to start. But there's, there's plenty of opportunity to connect with me. Anybody wants to shoot me an email uh, or give me a call, you can do that through my website. That'd be great. Sounds good. Thank you, Todd. All right. Ricky, have a great day. Okay, please check out all of our episodes of Austin Fit Talks. You can find those at Austin Fit Magazine.